Hello, everybody. Um, oh, clicker doesn't work. Nah. I thought we'd, uh, we're going to start with a presentation. It's not going to be too long, not too much listening to me. And then we're going to go into workshop mode, hence the uh, post-its and paper as you know, to be expected with any kind of GIST workshop. So we're from the National Centre for AI in Tertiary Education. We're also good at short titles in GIST. Um, we aim for catchy. So we were set up about two years ago with the aim to accelerate the adoption of artificial intelligence across the tertiary education sector in a responsible way. And that last phrase is key, really. Um, we, we're trying to take that approach, that um, pragmatic, practical approach, but also not suggesting people should just leap with abandon into embracing all things AI. Definitely they should explore and try it, but also to make sure that people are aware of the negatives, the pitfalls, and can approach it and make considered decisions. So in order to achieve our aim, we do four things. We run pilots. We provide information. We um, run some events and attend an awful lot of other people's events. And we have uh, quite a large and growing community. I'm going to run through a few things. So apologies, some people may see things they already know and they've already seen. Just briefly go through uh, understanding generative AI, then look at some specific challenges around assessments, meeting student needs, then just look at some of our pilots and then we'll move into the workshop. So generative AI, things have moved quite quickly over the last 12 months and amazingly quickly over the last six months. November, 2022, we had chat GPT and that's when things started to move. But, Generative AI is more than chat GPT. GPT, struggling with words, is the heat. Um, so this is just an il illustrative section. There are many, many more tools out there, but now we can use generative AI for chat, for search, images, coding, writing, content, amongst other things. Just thought it was interesting to show the timeline we had GPT-1 in 2018. Things moved relatively slowly, relatively normally really, for a technological advancement. Then 2021, we had DALI. We started with the images. And then 2022, we had a lot of growth in the images. Then we had GPT-3.5 and then chat GPT which is when the explosion started to occur. And 2023, the first six months of 2023, we've had all these and more. GPT-4 is paid for, just recently announced in the last two weeks, now has enterprise license available. So makes it more acceptable, has more. GPT-4 has more guidelines. I'll come on to that later. This slide was made on a day in July in which 27 new AI applications were added to Futurepedia. Just as an example of the speed of growth, the pace of growth in this sector. But it's also getting integrated into the tools we use every day. So things like Microsoft Copilot and Google Workspaces. It's coming. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen the videos for Microsoft Copilot. I can't wait for it to come. It almost feels like magic. You know, the idea that you can go into a team's meeting and it's going to just let you know the actions and who's going to do them afterwards without you writing them down on a piece of paper and then being in a different room when you want to know what you're supposed to be doing. AI in Google Docs. Now, if you're using Google Docs, you can choose to write it or you can ask it to help you write and it will help, it will suggest in the same way. Really, really simple to use. 
you, and you choose. You can toggle it on, you can toggle it off. Um, Wolfram Alpha has now been added. So that's a really good tool, um, particularly for mathematics students and lecturers. Subjects I'm really not going to go into, know nothing about. Gamma is an example of a tool that's not necessarily one of the big ones. It does presentations, it does web pages, does it really well. Uh, just get back to that. It works two ways. You can either ask it to generate a presentation or you can provide the content and ask it to do 10 slides. I was doing one of these in July and admitted I did this at 8.30 in the morning, so it was probably a little bit quicker. But I asked it to write me a PowerPoint on the employability skills students would need in 2030. It's an area I used to work in, it's an area I know, I know and understand, so I thought I could review it accurately. It took 30 seconds to generate 10 slides, diagrams, images, way more snazzy slides than I would have made in four hours. Um, it first of all gave me the outline. I looked at it, thought that looks good. I accepted that, but I could have changed it. And then the slides came and it, it took me 20 minutes or so to review them, to make a few changes, but then it was good to go. So start to finish, it took me probably 45 minutes to do that, which probably would have taken me three or four hours sitting at my desk. I would never have taken what it gave me and just walked into a room and presented it because that way lies failure. You know, the human, I think, is always necessary here. But it's a really good, you know, these tools are just really good at shortcutting some of those tasks that we have to do that can suck time. Sometimes, you know, I can just sit at my desk for ages trying to find the right image. So chat GPT in four bullet points. It was created by a company called OpenAI, which contrary to its name is not open, it is commercial, but other competitors exist. It's training on large chunks of the internet, plus some books, uh, plus content that we continue to give it. Humans help with the training by providing feedback. If you notice, it'll always ask you um, how you feel about the responses. And it works quite simply by predicting the next word, given the sequence of words preceding. It can write plausibly sounding text on any topic in almost any language. The key to that is plausible sounding. If you've never tried it, when you try it for the first time, you should always try it with something you know something about, because then you can tell how truthful it's being. It can generate answers to a range of questions, including coding, maths type problems, and multiple choice. It can also generate you multiple choice questions on content as well. It's getting increasingly accurate and sophisticated with each release, and it generates unique tests, text each time you use it. So when people talk about chat GPT passing an exam, you sometimes wonder how many goes they've had to have for it to pass the exam, and if they then tried again to pass exactly the same exam, it would probably fail. But it's great at a wide range of tasks like text summarization. It's really good for improving your writing and getting feedback. I use it, these tools quite a lot because I learned to write a lot, a lot when I worked for the civil service. So I was taught to write passively. So I find it quite useful to use these tools to make my writing more engaging. Or I might put something in and say, just generate me four tweets out of this and it does it. It's got limitations. So it can and often does generate plausible but incorrect information. And this will include false references and false claims about its capabilities. So if you put some test text in and ask it if it wrote it, it's highly likely to say yes, whether it did or not. And it's only trained on information up until September 2021. That's the free version, not the paid for. So concerns. It can and does produce biased output, culturally, politically, probably any, any way you can think of. It can generate unacceptable output sometimes. It has a very high environmental impact, lots of concerns around human impact, 
and the ownership of the material that people are putting into it. We don't quite know. And this danger of digital inequity. So assessment. This is how the media chose to focus on it. Just the selection. Rather unhelpfully, they chose to focus on the fact that it was killing education because it was making essays hard. Regardless of the fact that large swathes of the sector have been pressing for assessment to change for the last 12 years before generative AI came out. You know, at best, we can only hope that generative AI might be an accelerator to make that change happen quicker, but it's a change that most of us have been asking for for years. So tactics for assessment. There's basically three. Avoid, outrun, or adapt and embrace. Avoiding it, well, that really means just sticking with the Victorian model of sticking people in horrible rooms, usually cold in my experience, making them write at teeny tiny desks and get writer's cramp. I spent more time teaching myself to write for my less at for exams than I almost did teaching, you know, doing revision. Um, outrun, not something we advocate. There's always going to be much more effort put into beating these detector tools than there is in creating them. Um, so it's just going to be a constant arms race. Adapt and embrace is the, is the kind of message that we are promoting. You know, embrace the use of AI, discuss the appropriate use, include students in those discussions, and actively encourage its use to create authentic assessments. But just explore, use, have discussions, make informed decisions about how and when it's appropriate to use it. It's not always. The slides will be shared afterwards. So there are a couple with quite a few links on. Um, literally hot, out, hot off the press, there's a set of cards that we published last night um, based on uh, the top trumps for assessment. So this is assessment design in an AI enabled world. There are ideas for how you can change various assessment types. It's an interactive PowerPoint. And we're hoping that will be useful to help people to tweak and change their assessments for the immediate year. And there's some really good QAA guidance out on how to adapt your assessments. So is it possible to detect AI? Kind of, sort of, but not really. All of these systems today are not that good. The three techniques, writing style, classifiers, watermarking, each technique can be defeated. Each will give false positives. And there are a lot of data processing and contractual concerns. You know, where is the data you've submitted going? How are they using it? Are they using it to train the model up? You know, we don't know. Often that kind of thing is hidden in contracts. But even if you've got a model that says it's 97% accurate, that's an increase of 2% on the human element. And that's a huge workload issue for people to suddenly deal with an extra, a tripling of uh, queries. And that's if they're 97%. We ran a series of student forums over the spring, we spoke to students in both FE and HE. Uh, we spoke to students anonymously. We asked them what they thought about AI and assessment. Uh, most students, you know, they're already using AI. They think it should be allowed in assessment, but they agree that it should be used differently in different areas. Some of them came up with some quite creative suggestions, you know, for, for using a kind of bookmaker's model of allowing a certain amount of credit for use. Those against it were mainly English and FE students. Plagiarism, detection, they wanted clarity over what's allowed, what isn't allowed. They believe detectors can be beaten. And quite frankly, they were really um, quite vocal in their dislike of all the focus on plagiarism, which they were taking as thinking that their tutors, their academic staff were implying they were all cheating. 
They were generally against automated marking, but thought assisted marking was much more acceptable. They were very in favour of assessment changes, and the students were quite clear that they thought the focus of assessment should be more around their creativity and critical thinking. And they really wanted to move away into a different kind of teaching, less sage on stage, more practical, more involvement, more real world, and include use and potentials of AI. So way students are using chat GPT at the moment. And this is this is not um, this is not to say we we've decided that this is where the line is, but the line across what's acceptable, what's more acceptable or less acceptable. That's a discussion all institutions need to have and make their decision about where the line lies. It may be different in different institutions, maybe different with different subjects, different levels, but that's a really important discussion to have. And then it's really, really important to be exceedingly clear to the students and make sure they know where the information is that they can find. Because so many were saying, we don't have any guidance, and I knew they did. But if the student doesn't know it's there, then you might as well not have it. And it's really good to include students in some of those discussions. Just to go into one of those, why are students using ChatGPT for things like writing or translation? Because it doesn't just do the task. They can have a conversation with it. They can change the reading level. They can simplify, change the voice. Lots of particularly students that don't have English as a first language were saying they were using it to get a better understanding of what was being asked of them. And, you know, they can do that. They can have that conversation with a tool 24 seven. They don't necessarily, you know, click that they don't probably understand when they're in the right space to have that conversation with their um, tutor or whoever. And it's the fact that they can just keep going back. So they just get their understanding and they don't feel that they're pestering forever. Student concerns, they have quite a few. They're very concerned about information literacy. They don't feel that they, they, they necessarily have the skills to make those decisions for themselves. They are uh, concerned about data security, you know, what's happening with the stuff that they're putting in and they're using in the, these tools. How do they safeguard their privacy and their ownership? You know, if they're art students or something, they're using some kind of tools, they still want to feel that they own their own work. Um, detectors, we talked about that, plagiarism and ambigu ambiguous guidelines. Regulation for students, they thought it was about striking a balance. They were very, very keen on the kind of high level governmental um, regulation around big AI. They were le much less keen on strong regulation in institutions. You'd maybe expect that. Staff use, a lot of them were aware their staff, the staff were using it. They wanted the staff to be transparent and open and also confident so that they could ask questions and go to the staff to get help. Very concerned about access and affordability and also equity. So they were talking about things like, well, I can do this in my institution. My friend over the road can't. Students talk to each other. Um, so they're really keen that there's equity across the piece. Over-reliance, they're aware that there's a balance between balancing their use of AI, but also still continuing with their intellectual development. And they're really concerned about the impact on their future, the changes it's going to make to employment and jobs. So what they're asking for is more information, digital literacy, employability, skills around AI, practical training in how to use it responsibly. They also want to understand the future potential, where it's going, what they should be thinking about. You know, these are students. They see that they've got a long future and want to see where it's going. They want recommendations of tools they can use and how they can use them. They also um, would like, they're very concerned about ethical considerations. They want more clarity and they want it to go beyond plagiarism. They're very, um, very concerned about sustainability, human impact, 
you know, very concerned about the fact that the human impact tends to be concentrated on the less developed countries, you know, we're here reaping the benefits, but other people are being exploited to create these tools. And discussion, they really want to be involved in the conversations, please bring them into the conversations about what's happening. Just to illustrate digital inequity, in, inequality, sorry I'm struggling with some words today, um, it's just, I'm just hot and I'm dry. Um, so financially, there's a difference of £77 a month if you were to have, you know, Grammarly. And that's an assistive tech. You know, it's not something you should have to pay for. Midjourney, ChatGPT Plus, as opposed to the free version. And there's a real difference between the paid for and the free version. The paid for version is up to date. It has more, um, I've forgotten the word as well. I, I, it, it has more, what's the word? Go on, it's just gone. Um, you don't get unacceptable content. You don't get as much bias. It's, it's, it's a much better model. It also, um, on the new on the enterprise license, the data. If you have the enterprise license, your data is not used for training. It is it stays and remains your own data. So the more you pay for it, the better service you get, basically. Which obviously is going to generate a huge amount of digital inequity. There's um, there's basically. I think this is this is just really about expanding something we already know exists. The poorer the students are, the worse access they have to tools, the more support they need. We need to support our students in a good way. Some of the pilots we're running, I'm going to try and speed up. Teachermatic, they've got to stand out there, so I won't speak too much about them. But what they're doing, we're running that pilot at the moment. We've got um, eight colleges trying this for six months. And what it does is make it much easier for staff to create content and resources for their lessons. Grade, we've completed this pilot, so we've got the report up. This was a tool created by University of Birmingham students, and it's assisted marking for STEM subjects. So it works particularly well in large, for large numbers of classes because obviously it learns as you go, probably needs about 50 or 60 responses before it starts picking up and saying, you've marked this question in this way, would you like to accept the same kind of feedback? Body swaps, um, that's being used here for the VR demonstrations, if anybody's been over there. That's the intersection of VR and AI, and it's really useful for soft skills, helps the uh, student put themselves in the position of the other person, and it's also being used for medical and things like that. Anywise, pilot we've just recently finished, that's um, an audio learning, it, AI generates learning resources, small podcasts from your own existing content. So it just gives you another way of learning from something you already have. So that's enough of me. We're now going to go on to our workshop. So um, we begin if we balance the tables out a bit more. So a little bit of movement around. Um, five-ish per table, if we can move around to that. Um, you'll notice there's a, there's a big sheet of flip chart paper on the tables, and that's marked up near term, mid and long term, and then there's post-its and there's sharpies. Um, but what we would like you to do is to keep in mind the conference themes of diversity and inclusion and sustainability and social justice. Map out your hopes for education in those three areas. And we, we've deliberately called them near, mid and long, so that you put your own uh, definition on those, what it means to you. But to do that in groups, but then also to think about how, where AI can best support them, or if you think it shouldn't. So you can do those tasks as one, or as two separate levels. But if you can do them as discussions, as a table, that would be brilliant. And we'll circulate around.
Okay. Is that on though? Hello? Doesn't sound like it's on. No? Hello? No? Did that work? <laughs> Did it work? Oh. Hang on. Ooh. Right. Can everyone hear me? Hello. Sue, do that thing where you bang on the table. <laughs> okay, everyone, we're going to feed back now. Um, I've got no idea if the microphone's working. So hopefully online can maybe still hear me as well. Um, but we've just got the, the last bit of the session now so that we can come together and talk about what we've discussed and in relation to those themes. So I'm going to be picking on groups, um, hopefully all nominate a spokesperson. Um, I'd like to start uh, over here, actually, with this group, because I know you had some really good conversations going. Um, obviously, we've looked at, at near, mid and long, which we purposely didn't define just to make it a bit trickier. So I was wondering if we could start actually with some of your, your near term thoughts on AI and, and what your hopes are. Play. It's probably oh. word you see HR using for um, articles. They never really talk about the word play in this term for AI language or other tools. That is all I can do. And all that can say. <laughs> so, definitely the word that. That's a good word. I'm sure you do. Yes. And then, yeah, so you have to choose my report and have that. So, yeah, I mean, when you're <laughs> talking about it, uh, in the short term, it feels like AI is supporting the place of the big tech. So, we're thinking at the moment, AI is quite an echo chamber, and you have to see the application of the work of the data. But then, um, it can be used for the end of the use of more AI. And what kind of underground sensitive reasons is that? Say that again. Yeah, not get through it, you know, just show that out. It's mm -hmm. that it's implicit in that notion is AI's reproducing for me. Yeah. Mm, that's right. I don't speak out of just nothing. I, I co read a really fast version of the top of this particular. Um, and yeah, in a sense, what it spits out, especially the image generators, uh, the mm. racist, the homophobic, the yeah. gender. I've written a blog post on this if you want to have a look at it. Um, and it's really shocking, you know. Um, and undoubtedly, like students and staff are probably using the graphics to get the score, make the inputs. So, whatever you think about it. But play is really important. Uh, staff are not encouraged to play, they're encouraged to mm. have it as well as up scale. <laughs> <laughs> Very we found that level speed. And upscaling is usually in mm -hmm. rather than collaborative or yeah. collective with that. And as a result, people feel all their students overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, I study a doctor part time and I work full time. So how am I supposed to fit in all? And I go to the gym. <laughs> <That's that thing. laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no. Yeah, those are just some of the short term ones. It's great. Important. We yeah. don't talk about it because it seems not valid. Oh, no, I mean, I like that, certainly. Um, brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, we'll move on. Uh, do you guys want to talk about the long term? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the worst one. Uh, tell us the future. <laughs> we had a discussion about new papers versus good papers. Mm. We flipped from one to the other. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the Douglas Adams quote that anything that mm -hmm. was in the world when you were born is just the way the world is. Anything invented before you are something like 30 is fantastic and interesting and you could make an excellent career out of it. Anything invented by the time you're over 40 is the devil's work and the end of civilization is the devil's But so we did talk a lot about our theories, but you asked us our hopes. So, mm -hmm. probably, as certain things become automated by AI, we will value the human skills more. 
So the fun things that will be outsourced with technology, and then the tools around empathy and human connection and problem solving, we will actually go more with. It might make some more people. We might prepare students better for an AI world. We might have a disruptive look at the curriculum and what I have said mm -hmm. before. We said this could be more disruptive than the pandemic mm -hmm. because it might fit. But we really have to change. And I think students might become more leaders. And we might have more authentic assessment, which we've been banging on about for a long, long time. And then we did it on, but not much on. Anything else? No, it's a good story. Yes, that's brilliant. Yeah. It's interesting with respect to something we're going back to Peter Bryan's work around Snapback. Maybe this is the end of Snapback. Maybe there's no coming back. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I think everyone's feeling that on assessment as well. Um, shall we go? Uh, I'm going to switch around to the back right there. Um, I will let you pick whether you want to do near, mid, or long term. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I think I love that. Um, definitely with that generative AI boom this year and everyone is so focused on the tools and less about yeah how we're going to use them really to promote our humanity as well. Something for us to think about, Sue. Um, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Mm. Fab. All right, and um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so straight down there, would you give us uh, something in the short term that you're hopeful for? Yeah. <laughs> if you've got a really good one that you want to share, yeah. yeah uh, in, yeah, no. That's no, that's great. And um, last group there. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to give you the choice. <laughs> Developing digital skills and supporting more staff and students. 
Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, I love that there's been so many mentions around accessibility and neurodiverse users. And um, that's something that we've we've looked at a bit this year and we really want to focus on, particularly in this coming academic year. So it's good to know as well that, that everyone is thinking about it. Um, well, thanks so much, everyone, for, for coming and working together. I'll just leave us with um, a couple more links for our resources. Um, the QR code will take you to our National Centre for AI webpage. You can get to all of our reports there. Um, we've just put out our third edition. We do a yearly report, nice, really big report looking at all AI in education. Um, and we've got links as well to Explore AI, where we've got a series of AI demos. And we've got those at our stand outside as well, if you want to come along and play with those there. And lastly, uh, do stay in touch with us. So we have a JISC mail. If you aren't on enough JISC mails already, have another one. Um, we do a nice uh, monthly newsletter there that Sue sends out as well to keep you updated on those resources. And we are building a community as well so that we can keep in touch. And hopefully we're going to be running some, some monthly sessions as well this year so that we can keep in touch online and keep those discussions going. Unclick me. You go. Thanks, Laura. So thank you, Sue and Helen, for leading us today. I think um, this is an area um, we were just saying in our group, it, it feels like staff and students are maybe at a similar sort of space or, you know, place in this whole AI um or AI world that's kind of emerging. And those of us in the room, I guess, are trying to stay a step ahead and think ahead. And it, we don't really know. I think we've kind of, we had the struggle in our group about dystopian futures and utopian ones, as was said, but um, it's gonna be interesting to see how it all pans out. So um, I hope we can continue these conversations. I think, um, I think it was really interesting yesterday to hear from one of the students who actually was being prescribed one of these AI tools, Scholarcy, to, to kind of do exactly what you were highlighting on one of the slides, Sue, about helping you know, to sort of digest some of these complex articles and things. So some of these tools are already making a difference in terms of you know, inclusion and equality and helping those students. Um, it would be interesting to see how it all transpires. But thank you, everyone, for your participation. And thank you to Helen and Sue for leading us. Uh, we'll just give them appreciation.